The American Psychological Association defines bullying as any form of aggressive behavior in which someone intentionally and repeatedly causes another person injury or discomfort. And it occurs more often than you may think. In America, 20% of students ages 12 to 18 experienced bullying nationwide. But bullying is not limited to schools. God's people over all the world and all through time have been abused because of their faith. It's likely that someone close to you is being bullied because they are Christians. If you want to know how to help a friend, relative, or neighbor who is being treated badly because they trust in Jesus for their salvation, then stay tuned to today's podcast because today, Nathan Norman, Kent Edwards, and Vicki Hitzkiss discover the Apostle Peter's anti-bullying strategy in the opening verses of 1 Peter. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman begin a discussion through the book of First Peter. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to First Peter chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2, as we join their discussion. Vicki, Nathan, have you known people who have suffered some kind of harassment uh, because of their faith? I have. Well, tell us about it. You know, I don't want to, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I don't. I, I, it, 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 it was hurtful, and then I don't, I don't want to bring it back up for people. I don't want to, but I have, and it's, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. Vicky's doing a good job of protecting the identity of the guilty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's, it is incredibly difficult. You know, I, as a pastor, uh, there's a number of people who come to the church, mostly women, but some men who have an unbelieving spouse Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's really hard. It's really difficult. I know one in particular, the husband is just so antagonistic about faith. And anytime going to church or anytime uh, doing kind of outreach to the community, he mocks it. He ridicules it. He t tells her how much of a waste of a time it is and how much she's wasting her life. It's difficult. And I know him pretty well because we see each other in the community and we talk and, and he's pretty antagonistic about the entire faith angle. Yeah. He is even to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. To be in the context of marriage, to be married to an unbeliever can bring all kinds of hassles. I mean, I'm just reminded of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7. If any brother has a wife who's not a believer and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. I mean, it's pretty clear, Paul's saying that because Christian values are so different from that of unbelievers, you have legitimately irreconcilable differences, right? Right. Yeah. And so in marriage, it's, it's incredibly emotional. In the workplace, it's hard too. Yeah. Uh, one of the leaders in my church, she works in a large professional setting. The month of June was LGBT Pride Month. Mm. Uh, and corporate said that they were going to hang rainbow flags everywhere. They were going to put them in everyone's office and basically on everyone's stuff. And she just said, you know, I don't like put them up in the, the office spaces and, you know, the common areas. It's fine. Like, don't put them on my desk and don't put them in my office because that says that I support this. And I don't. It's not that I am going to be mean spirited or hateful towards my LGBT friends, mm -hmm. but. I can't support uh, broken human sexuality. Mm. And, uh, and they, they fought her and fought her and fought her and fought her. And she was so gracious. And we talked through things and you know, the things she wanted to say versus the things she did say. We prayed through it over the, over the weeks, but eventually she had to resign. Uh, yeah. They made it so bad and they kept finding things to write her up about that had nothing to do with anything uh, that she had to resign and go find another job. Wow. Wow. Well, I know being up in Canada recently, I learned that um, you really can't speak out against homosexuality. That's considered hate speech now. Right. That causes all kinds of issues for Christians. I know my, my wife years ago worked for a company where um, she found it challenging working with, uh, because, because of her faith. She would be uh, on business trips with a group of 
people from her office. And at the end of the day, <laughs> some of her coworkers wanted to go and uh, relax in environments that um, were not compatible with the Christian faith. And my wife had to say, no, I'm not, I'm not going there. Um, drop me off. There, there's tension there. I, I'm not sure it would rise to bullying, but certainly it was awkward for her in that, right. in that setting. And you find that when you, in all areas of life, with friendships, workplace, marriage. But when people who are close to us, as that uh, woman is that you just described, Nathan, when people who are close to us are bullied, they're, when they're facing aggressive behavior in which someone intentionally and repeatedly is causing them injury or discomfort because of their commitment to Christ, it's hard to know how to help. How can we minister effectively to them? Well, I think if there's one person I would consider an expert on ministering to the spiritually bullied, that would have to be the Apostle Peter, which is why we're looking, beginning a series of podcasts in the book in First Peter. And as we come to this book, one of the first questions that we need to ask ourselves is who is Peter's audience? Who is he writing to? And he gives that away right at the very beginning in verse one, Vicki, when, well, would you read that for us? Sure. He says in verse one that he's writing to exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I can't okay. picture any of those places. <laughs> Asia, Asia, I got Asia. <laughs> Uh, so on our show notes, I have put up a map so that uh, the three of us can uh, see where those places are, but uh, that's not possible on an audio video uh, recording to pass that on. So Nathan, uh, can you give us some context? Can you help make sense out of these strange places that Peter is mentioning? Right. They're places outside of Jerusalem's control. They're outside of kind ah. of the Judean uh, control area, and he's talking to Jewish individuals who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, and largely they've had to flee. They have been kicked out of their family. They've been exiled from their work because they chose to follow Christ, and they've been rejected by their communities, by their families, and their culture. So they had to leave, and they had to go find something else to do and somewhere else to live. That speaks highly of them. It does. Although their exit probably was not voluntary. Right. But no, but that they didn't renounce their faith, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like an axe after Stephen was stoned to death. And <laughs> and you figure like, well, that's it with Christianity. And everyone fled. And you're like, oh, they fled. Oh. And, and they, yeah, I don't know about you, but when I'm scared and I'm fleeing, I, I just keep my mouth shut and I run. But here they run and they continue to share about Jesus. And the gospel spreads as a result, right? And so that's kind Pretty of the same cool. here, right? They, they, cool. They're running away, and they have to run away. It's forced exile, essentially, but they continue to share their faith in Jesus Christ, which is utterly incredible. It is. And here, Peter's writing to those kind of people, people who have are separated geographically from their home, culturally from their home. That's why Peter's writing a letter, and he's not preaching to them, because they're, they're too far away. Peter's ministry was almost exclusively to Jewish people and centered right around Jerusalem. But now he's writing to those Christians that he probably will never see again. Those who were forced to leave their homes, families, and culture because of their faith in Christ. People who were bullied for their faith. That had to endure all manner of aggressive behavior because of love of Christ. And that means there are tensions when you have people who are Christians in a non-Christian culture, because our values, our practice and customs of our culture are different than their culture. And so people feel threatened by Christians because our views are so different and our ethics and morals are intractable. And so we can face bullying. So how does Peter help them? How does this expert in dealing with bullying respond to these people in their difficult new environment. Well, how does he start? <laughs> I, I had you read part of verse one last time, Vicki, but how does it actually begin? What does he say in verse one and two? He says, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I just find this interesting because 
this is just that little beginning, you know, before the letter. He's not really into the content. He's just kind of saying, you know, in our letters, we say, dear so-and-so, hope you're doing well. And then we get into the content of the letter. So, you know, often their introductions to the epistles are so short, we kind of skip them, but <laughs> Peter can't help himself. I mean, because he knows these people, because he knows what they're going through, he immediately speaks words of encouragement, doesn't he? Peter encourages them. Because one thing that bullied people need is encouragement. Those who work with bullying in our school system tell us, when you're being bullied, having trusted people you can turn to for encouragement and support will ease your stress and boost your self-esteem and resilience. Now, when we know people who are being bullied, facing difficult times and pushback because of their faith, we need to encourage them. And Peter does that. He begins by saying, telling them, you are God's elect. You are God's chosen people. As God chose the Israelites, as God chose Abraham and his descendants to be his people, so God has chosen you. That's, that's pretty encouraging, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, when, uh, when you feel like you're a nobody and nobody cares, but then to turn around and say, no, 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 God has a plan. And not only does he have a plan, he has a plan for you. Hmm. In fact, this is, uh, um, I think, Peter directly making reference to their Jewish roots, his readers' Jewish roots. Because this really sounds an awful lot like that famous passage uh, Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 7, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, in Deuteronomy 7, it says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and chose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out of a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So this is God keeping his promise to you, and he did it because he loved you. Yeah, and he specifically says it doesn't, not because you were the biggest or the best or the greatest, right? Right. <laughs> not the most romantic, not the most powerful, not the most attractive. The little runt. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we always think that the people that uh, have the greatest advantages deserve it. You have to have the greatest SAT scores to get into the best colleges. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to bring in the most sales to be uh, advanced in your company. You have to uh, have the most skill to be chosen enough for the best sports teams. Uh, we always think that's the best get rewarded the most. <laughs> God says the opposite. God did not choose Israel because they're the biggest and best. But he chose to love them despite their failings. He chose them, in spite of their failings, to be his people, his children. He chose them because of his love not their goodness. They didn't earn or deserve it. They were given it out of love. And just as the Jews were granted that status because of God's love, Peter is saying, you share that same status. God, out of his love, has chosen you to be his own. <laughs> they weren't born into that. They were chosen to have, specifically chosen, to have that privilege by God. Nathan, I know you have an adopted child, a child that you have chosen to love and make a full member of your family. Have you ever spoken to her about the unique privilege of being a chosen child? Yeah, almost every opportunity we get, we've talked openly about her being adopted, and mm -hmm. uh, that means we chose her. And <laughs> it's it's funny because we talk about it so often and so positively, and, and we, we link it to our salvation as well and what Christ mm -hmm. has done for us to uh, make it as positive as possible. But we talk about it so often that my my son is like, oh, man, I wish I was adopted, right? <laughs> we, <laughs> and and I, think, I, I think that's right because culturally, I mean, I grew up with all kinds of jokes within our, our culture. We're like, oh, well, you're adopted as if like, oh, well, you're a second class <laughs> member of the family. And we've really tried hard, both at our church, because we have a lot of adopted people at our church, uh, and in our home, to buck against that that cultural meanness and, and just misunderstanding. I mean, even the pagan Romans understood that adoption meant full rights 
of family. Uh, there mm-hmm. were emperors who adopted people into their family, unseating their own birth children by birth order because of age. Wow. Uh, and they would, the, the next person would become emperor. Uh, because of it. So even if those pagans get it, and yet our culture seems to not understand, no, no, this is not a second class member of the family. This is a member with full rights. So mm. much so <laughs> that my younger son is is like, oh man, I wish I was adopted because uh, we've we've shown it to be such a positive thing, which is what Peter is showing us here and what we see throughout the, the scriptures. And Peter's encouraging these suffering people, these bullying, bullied people by saying, you're your bullying is not because I don't love you. I have chosen you. You're a full member. In fact, it's because I've chosen you that that you are being bullied. Think about it. They're bullying you because you have been chosen to be princes of the king of kings. So of course you're going to be treated differently. You're, you're a whole different family than they are. I mean, if you think about it, in the same way that the royal family of England stands apart from the multitudes who might crowd Trafalgar Square on a weekday, you are strangers among the throngs of humanity. You are royalty, and they are not. So you're not being persecuted, you're not being bullied because you have lesser status than them, but as you pointed out, Nathan, because of far greater status. You're a child of the king, and you have blessings today and a future tomorrow that others cannot imagine and will never enjoy. You have been chosen. How? Because of the foreknowledge of God the Father. What does that mean? What does it mean, chosen because of the foreknowledge of God the Father? That means before the earth was even formed, God knew you and chose you, literally chose you. Yeah. And he chose you knowing what you were going to become, knowing what you would do knowing how undeserved you were. Yet for some reason buried in his own grace, he chose you to bear his name. Is that not encouraging? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The crazy thing, and you said we bear his name, right? Uh, I've got another friend. They have, uh, they adopted a son years ago and uh, oh my gosh, he's a mess. Like he, he's, he's an adult now and he just makes constant, like terrible choices, awful choices. And I remember at one point, you know, when we were in our adoption process thinking like, oh, how terrible right now, now this family, they've adopted this kid, this upstanding family has adopted this kid. <laughs> and, and for years, he's just been raking their name through the mud, right? Oh, uh-huh. how terrible for them. How difficult. And then all of a sudden, I think the Holy Spirit nudged me. It's exactly what God has done with you, Nathan. <laughs> right? Like God takes his name and he gives it to me and I don't represent him well all the time. And yet he doesn't revoke it. He doesn't stop it. He still says, I love you. And I've called you my own. Yeah. We can encourage those around us who are facing bullying for their faith by reminding them whose they are, that they bear the name of the King of Kings. But it's interesting in that passage, Deuteronomy 7, that you read earlier, Vicki, that um, <laughs> Moses goes on in that passage after he tells them God chose them for his love. He does give them a warning, right? Do you mind reading the last section of that passage? Sure. It says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws that I give you today. Woo! What is God warning to Israel in this passage? obey God. Or else? There's going to be destruction coming. I mean, we think of God as being loving, and He is, Sure. but there's going to be a day of judgment. Yeah. Those whose behavior rebels against Him, He will repay to their face by destruction. To their face by destruction. What does that mean, Nathan? Wow. I can't imagine. God is terrifying. I mean, God is good, but He is also very scary. (laughs) 
<laughs> they, when when God brings ultimate judgment in their lives, uh, more than likely this is referring to the end of their lives when they stand before judgment before God. They will know what they did was wrong, and they'll know mm. that they deserve uh, whatever their punishment is. There's going to be no argument. There's going to be no appeals. Uh, they will know that they deserve, and they've uh, they're going to receive the right judgment or justice for what they've done. Yeah, I think you're right. But did God also exercise his wrath on Israel for their sins before they stood before the great white throne of judgment? Sure. Yeah. You're going <laughs> to... He, he, he did it throughout their entire history, right? Whenever they wandered away and started worshiping false gods and the Asheroths and Baals and, and whatnot, he would raise up oppressors to kind of not so gently bring them back into uh, back into the fold and understand their need for him. Uh, eventually, he uh, he obliterated the northern kingdom of Israel right. and brought uh, Judah into exile for 70 years. Yeah. It, so they did face that wrath for their sin. And the writer of the book of Hebrews makes that clear when he says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Wow, mm. that's pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. So God has saved us. God loves us. God does not tolerate sin. Didn't in the Old Testament, doesn't in the New. But Peter continues his encouragement uh, in spite of this reality by pointing out that while God's holiness is non-negotiable, he has given them his newly chosen people, unprecedented resources to live a holy life. And what does he say in, in God, uh, verse 2? It says, To God's elect, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Christ Jesus and sprinkled with his blood. The sanctifying work of the Spirit. Nathan, what's sanctification? That's a big word. It's where God makes us more like himself. He takes our character and our nature and conforms it more to himself. He makes us holy as he is holy. And it's a process, which okay. is really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so the sanctification was important in the Old Testament as well as in the New, Tes in the New Testament. Right. Um, but the big difference is that while God's standards have not changed Old Testament to New Testament, certainly our resources have changed. Because in Acts 2, what happened? What's the big game changer? The Holy Spirit came down. Yeah. So now every child of God is indwelt with his Holy Spirit. So this sanctification, is it's critical and is necessary. And if we are not sanctified, if we're not holy, we, we will face the wrath of God. But we have a spirit within us, God's spirit within us, to help us be holy, right? Yeah. And that's why Paul can say in Galatians 5, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and so on. And I warn you, as I did before, Paul says, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that sounds Old Testament. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That means that as the Holy Spirit works in our life, the natural fruit, the outpouring of, his, of the evidence of his work within us are these characteristics. He makes them present in our life. Isn't that encouraging? Yes, we have to be holy, but the Holy Spirit, his presence almost makes it inevitable that we can become holy, right? Right. Having that resource makes all the difference. Knowing that God is always near makes all the difference. And his work in our life, wow, that's a game changer. Which is why Paul says in Ephesians 1, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Guaranteeing our inheritance. 
Basically, you can't lose your inheritance because you have a Holy Spirit inside of you who will make you the child that God wants you to be. Unless you deliberately decide to walk away, this is what will happen. In this passage, Peter is reminding these bullied people that they are now and forever will be a precious child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that God has chosen them to be his children and empowered them to live like his children. So <laughs> he's saying to them, don't give in to the bullying of your dominant culture. You don't need to because of who you are and what's God's doing in your life. The writer of the book of Hebrews tells us, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, encouraging one another and all the more as the day is approaching. Friends, as Peter has encouraged us, we have a responsibility to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ when they are bullied. Your encouraging words to them, reminding them of how God values them and how God has equipped them can ignite a spark of energy, especially when they're feeling low, discouraged, or unmotivated. Let people know that they're not alone, that God has their back, that you have their back. When you encourage people, it lets people know that you admire them for the faithfulness that they've displayed. So Vicki, how would you encourage our listeners in light of this passage? To remind them that God loves them and loved him so much that he picked them to be his child. Let us never forget that when the world picks on you, remember that God in his love picked you to be his child. If you or someone you know or love is being bullied for being a Christian, encourage them. How? Remind them that God in his love chose them to be his child. I trust that today's discussion of God's word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on your social media and telling your friends. Tune in next Friday as we continue our discussion through 1 Peter. Be sure to join us.